I'm uh, very happy to be here. It's really exciting to be talking to the next generation of brain researchers and uh, hopefully neuromorphic computing uh, programmers and developers. So this is um, truly a, an, an ecosystem, a new wave of computing that we see coming and, and you truly are instrumental in uh, its success. And, um, and, and, and this is this new era that I'm talking about, which hopefully will be uh, clear from the context of what, what I see is uh, from an industry perspective, granted um, what, what this new era that we're entering and, and what needs to happen, what the challenges we face and how um, I, I think we may be able to tackle them. Uh, so let's see, first I'll advance here. Uh, I do represent a corporation. I have to show the, uh, the uh, legal disclaimer material, but uh, you can read that I'm sure in, in the time you have. Um, so first to, to motivate why we're interested in neuromorphic computing at all, or looking to the brain specifically for inspiration and bringing that into uh, computer architecture, into computing devices. And you don't have to look far. You don't even have to look to the human brain, although I know that's the focus of of, of your broad organization here, um, but it, even, even brains in the simplest or relatively simple of animals, I mean, insects even can do incredible things. But if you look at, say, a cockatiel parrot as an example um, that has about a, you know, a two gram brain, and you compare that to uh, what technology has provided to us now after many decades of advances in, in uh, computer chips, um, the autonomous drone. That's a form factor that's only been enabled in, in, in the past few years, um, which has about a 40 gram brain based on uh, you know, the size of a silicon chip that can be uh, you know, a CPU or a GPU can be inserted in there. Um, there's still a, a dramatic difference. There's a big chasm of capability uh, between that small uh, biological brain and, and uh, an autonomous drone. And um, this, this data here is somewhat old. Um, you know, this was just a few years ago when they first uh, launched the, the first of these autonomous drone racing competitions at, uh, at IROS, the robotics conference. Um, and, and now speeds have increased certainly since then. But what remains um, it really, really it's differentiating between these two capabilities is the, the wealth and the variety of workloads and the efficiency and the speeds of processing um, in, in these two different types of computing devices. Um, the autonomous drone is, is uh, flying between a pre-programmed sequence of gates and uh, although there is some intelligence capability implemented on that, thanks to the gains in deep learning over the past uh, decade or so, it's, it's a very specific task that this uh, device has been trained to accomplish offline um, using a large amount of pre-collected data. And that drone can basically recognize gates and the orientations of those gates, and that's all. And uh, biological brain here, on the other hand, can uh, fly at high speeds, learning on the fly an entirely new environment, understanding what objects are, what the significance of these objects are, how to navigate, how to forage for food, how to interact with other cockatiels, um, singing, for example, between them. Um, and cockatiels can do things that clearly they were not evolutionarily or offline uh, trained for, such as learning uh, human language, you know, a few words anyway, and really understanding what those words are, uh, the meaning of them to some degree, and learning how to manipulate cups, even there's reports of these with cockatiels. Um, so understanding kind of the affordances of objects and being able to, to, to use them for some kind of, you know, purpose, tool making in some sense. Um, and of course, there's no learning at all. On an autonomous drone, um, given even these kind of strict power budgets of what we can supply and what we can um, compute at that, those levels, um, there's really not much uh, left for adaptation. Certainly there's no room for the in, you know, extremely computationally demanding backpropagation kinds of learning that was used to, to train this in the first place. So, uh, so everything from the, uh, the, the acuity of the visual inferences the, uh, the, the speeds that these, uh, the, these systems are able to inference and process, the amount of adaptation, the, rel the breadth of different workloads, um, and of course, ultimately the power level that all of this is being uh, performed under is still orders of magnitude difference uh, between what biology has been able to achieve uh, through, through evolution and what we've been able to achieve through Moore's law and, and recently uh, deep learning. 
So, so this difference, well, at Intel, you know, we're not specifically interested in enabling uh, autonomous drones, although that's, that's uh, perhaps an important future market segment. Um, we're interested in understanding and, and uh, developing the computing technology that could be used, for example, to replicate the capabilities in this kind of a power and uh, latency constrained form factor. Um, and, and really, this is nothing new. Uh, probably you all are, are well aware that brains have motivated and inspired computing for decades, all the way back to the origins of, of modern computing. Uh, John von Neumann, Alan Turing, the greats today uh, that, that we regard as the uh, fathers of of, of modern computing, um, you know, they had the brain in mind. And you look at some of those early papers and you find the language of neuroscience in there because that was all they had, the only vocabulary they had to describe some of their speculations and their thinking about how to compute in intelligent ways. Um, and, uh, you know, meanwhile, back in the, shortly after the 40s, when the, the, the von Neumann computer architecture was, was invented and um, it proved to be so successful, there was a, a move towards more uh, literally neuroscience inspired ways. So things like the perceptron, of course, was famously one of the first truly neuromorphic computers in the sense that it was a neuron that had analog synapses. Now, now that perceptron uh, had 16 neurons and it filled, uh, you know, multiple large scale cabinets um, in, in, you know, in a large room. So, so uh, certainly that's, that's a far, far uh, way from where we are today. But, but over those decades, there's been uh, much progress, of course, in both of these. And they moved far beyond these original biological uh, concepts that sort of inspired them into the realm of a very rigorous engineering uh, design and development um, technology. And, and today we have a, a, a virtuous cycle of sorts of that's happening there, where the gains in the computing power has uh, in turn uh, allowed larger and larger models, more sophisticated kinds of training to be applied uh, to these uh, you know, multi-layer perceptron type uh, models now, and, and you get greater and greater capabilities. That in turn is driving you know, larger and larger, more complex and uh, computationally intensive chips. And, um, and that is of course what, what's defined in, in many ways the past few years of computing with the rise of deep learning and the great uh, uh, value that that's bringing to uh, industry and really the real world in, in innumerable ways. But we still, um, you know, there's still this uh, challenge with deep learning. And, and that's that these gains that are coming are coming at an increasing cost in computational power. And this is, you know, very well known at this point, although it was still controversial just even a few years ago. Um, but, but clearly when you look at this pace of the amount of computational uh, requirements that are needed to train these latest deep learning models, um, the pace is far outstripping what Moore's law can provide. So this uh, again is an older chart, but over a span of six years, there was a 300,000 times increase in the amount of compute needed to learn in these models or train these models. And uh, Moore's law over that time, even in its most healthiest form, would have provided maybe an eight times improvement uh, in, in, in the amount of compute available. So that's not necessarily a problem from the standpoint of, of, um, uh, of technology development and still providing great value to the world. Um, but it is certainly the case that this is not, this technology in particular is not on a trajectory to close that efficiency gap uh, with nature. And uh, in other respects, more conceptual, we can see that deep learning is fantastic a tool as it is, it is limited and, it, and it's certainly doing something quite different from what we think of intuitively as natural learning as we might see in a cockatiel brain or in a baby's brain or in human brains. Um, and, and, and that's in the sense that deep learning is really performing um, curve fitting in some sense, given the data set, it does a fantastic job of interpolating and understanding that specific data set such that if you request uh, points that are lying within that domain, the scope of that data set, you get incredibly good results. But natural learning uh, is, is uh, learning with few data samples and, and it's a uh, abstracting and conforming uh, uh, generalizations with these few data sets such that the out of uh, uh, model ex extrapolation is sometimes more reasonable. It's more informed by a larger sense of common sense and more uh, you know, generalized intelligence that, that we speak of. And, uh, 
and and the and the type of learning is very different in the sense that deep learning is offline and batched in order to be successful. There's 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 movements within this community and neuromorphic community to push it online, but nevertheless, it requires this large number of data samples with slow incremental steps to the final solution, as opposed to these uh, examples where you have you know single data points that are rapidly changing the the, the organism's understanding of the world, and you can see that uh, in uh, you know one of my favorite examples is with a with a small toddler just learning about you know an infant learning about cats for the first time and they need only see a few examples of, of a few different cats different colors different orientations and then immediately that child will understand what a cartoon of a cat is um, you know on 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 a 2D uh, visual screen. And that, that looks nothing like what's in the data set. It's clearly showing that internally in the brain, there's some representation of those uh, and reinterpretation, abstraction of the data samples that have been provided that then allow it to uh, uh, understand I mean, it, it, examples that are far outside of that training set. So uh, what that means is it motivates this ongoing exploration. And that's what those of us in the neuromorphic computing field have, have, have been trying to do, is to bring this kind of more modern understanding or what we understand today from neuroscience into the computing realm, fresh, anew, and to see what uh, gains that can provide. And that began back in the 1980s with uh, Carver Mead, Caltech, and others, um, you know, particularly looking at the retina and trying to replicate some of the analog computing and the photodiode type of uh, processes uh, that, that uh, one finds in biological eyes. And, and that particular technology has progressed quite nicely over the past two decades as, as um, you know, is quite uh, evident. We have a number of companies uh, commercializing that, including, you know, large co companies like Sony and Samsung. And um, meanwhile, there's been movement towards the compute end of that. And uh, that that began with analog uh, chips, you know, very focused on replicating some of the kind of the membrane dynamics uh, of, of, of these uh, of, uh, biological neurons. Um, and, and in recent times, there's been a, a move towards scaling up to large scale, um, scalable neuromorphic chips that are capable of solving, you know, problems of, of industrial relevance. And um, of course, my group represents uh, part of that effort. Um, Human Brain Project, of course, has Spinnaker um, and uh, Brain Scales too, to a degree, which is scaled up. Um, and you know, we see largely a transition to digital chips, not because digital is the right answer over the long term necessarily, but it's certainly the the best tool today to create uh, larger scale systems that are able to tackle uh, meaningful problems. Um, so that's where we are, um, and and what that's motivated from from. Uh, our perspective uh, at Intel is we have a new class of computer architecture. And this is, you know, deviating a little bit from the focus on the, you know, analog membrane dynamics, let's say of biological neurons, but more focus on the macroscopic picture of some of these fundamental properties that we find in brains that are intriguingly different from what are in standard computing architectures, parallel computing architectures like GPU. Um, and you know, you're, you're probably well familiar with some of these. So, uh, so this integration of compute and memory, for example, such that you don't have to move uh, the data continuously through an off-chip memory, which, which has great implications into the overall architecture of the computer if you're doing that. Um, and um, uh, asynchronous communication, asynchronous computation, um, and, and the uh, computation fundamentally being sparse. So preferring off states uh, at, at all levels, preferring non-connections over dense connections and you know, not communicating versus communicating in order to achieve uh, power efficiency, um, yet without sacrificing computational capability. And so this is the regime that we've been exploring at Intel for the past, um, you know, five years, six years now. And uh, that's, that's led, of course, to Loihi, which we published uh, some years ago, three, four years ago. And um, it, as, as you're well aware, uh, it, you, you probably know something about Loihi, and this is really not too different from other neuromorphic chips, such as what the Human Brain Project has also produced. Um, there's, there's a number of very interesting uh, properties about these, trying to harness you know, these biological principles um, that dis differentiate it from standard computing. 
And for one thing, they, it doesn't have any floating point numbers. There's no multiply accumulator units, which are fundamental to deep learning accelerators. Uh, there's no off-chip DRAM. So the fact that these chips are able to compute anything at all is really a testament to the success of these biological principles at, at work and as implemented in, in uh, you know, in this case, a digital chip implemented with asynchronous communication, asynchronous interconnect, um, providing this kind of scalability similar to brains. We, we've built our, ourselves systems, everything from a USB form factor device with you know, one or two chips in it that natively connect to uh, these event cameras, um, these neuromorphic spiking cameras, all the way up to large scale data center rack appliances shown here um, that have this one 768 chips in it. So we're able to explore this whole range uh, from, from the very small scale to the very large scale. And that's led to a number of you know, very uh, important learnings from our perspective as we try to move this forward to commercialization. And that's, that's the next era that I, I'm referring to in this talk that I'll, I'll, I'll cover is what, what we see now to move it out of the lab and then into the real world is, is what we're interested in. Now, this uh, research it has, has given us a different perspective on AI computation, as we expected it would. Um, but, um, it, you know, this is, uh, the slide here is, is showing what, what I mean by that. So when you start with this completely intertwined model of computing and memory being co-located and, and integrated, in our case, across this mesh of 128 cores uh, per chip, each one of these cores, including all specialized memories associated with neural processing, um, what this allows with this event-based the compute model is individual data samples can, can be serviced as they arrive in time. And that temporal significance of that data sample, whether it's a packet of data coming from a sensor or a, the host CPU, or it's a spike or a message, a short message within the, the, uh, the chip, the, these can be propagated through in an event-based manner such that only the activated downstream units or neurons are, are performing computation as those spikes are propagating through the system. And, and that means there can be a trickle of activity. You're not waking up an entire array or memory system or cache um, that, that consumes energy. And, and uh, not only does it consume energy to activate an entire uh, memory or uh, memory structure and data bus, but it takes time too to, to process a, a, a vectorized kind of batch of data. And, and so when you're in this spike-based regime, there's a latency and an energy gain that comes from this because information is trickling through the system um, in this event-based way. It's percolating and, and, and emitted, uh, the final answer comes out in, in the most minimal time possible, um, as opposed to needing to process large segments of zeros and inactive elements that um, will happen if you're, if you're formulating the problem in more of a, a matrix kind of style of uh, arithmetic uh, for, uh, framework. And now each of these neural units, um, you know, in contrast to the, the uh, neurons that are deployed in, in a deep learning model, have state. Uh, they're temporal filters, really. They're, they're not um, functions necessarily. They're not static functions. They're temporal filters is the way to think of this from an electrical engineering perspective. And so you're really disrupting a system, a dynamical system that is sitting in some kind of equilibrium state as, as data is entering the system. And there's dynamics that are moving the system to some kind of a new uh, equilibrium state um, or, or perhaps never into a new, new equilibrium state, but it's seeking a new equilibrium state. And, and the learning that happens the, in the system is through self-organization. So weights being modified and changed in, in response to the input data moving through the system. And, and that is a, you know, a self-organization process. It's, a, it's an emergent form of computation. It's an emergent form of, of learning. And uh, you know, this, this is very much like what's happening in the brain. And, and this is ultimately the computational model that we have to work with in this new computer architecture, which is extremely foreign and different from the perspective of conventional standard computing. Um, and, and, Compared to conventional computing, I've already spoke about some of these differences, but, but the implications are, 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 are fairly important in the sense that once you have a memory that is, um, and it may be a, a memory hierarchy as we have in modern processors where, where there's a cache system, but nevertheless, the same applies that you have to stream data through this memory system. And you're doing that in, in a wide data bus. 
And there's large latencies just to go and access any individual data element in that memory. And to hide the latency, you have to keep this bus that's feeding and, and accessing the memory full. So that steers the entire architecture and the uh, programming uh, space into a batched and vectorized uh, regime in order to be efficient. If you don't do that, the whole architecture, all this complexity that's built in is, is not achieving uh, the, the, the best performance and the best uh, energy efficiency. So, so that, that in turn pushes the algorithmic, the AI uh, framework into this, this paradigm of feed forward uh, functions, layered neural networks, where the, the, there's no recurrence at all in the inner loop, so to speak, of this uh, function. The neurons themselves, of course, don't have state. And uh, the, the learning process is an extremely delayed outer loop where Data samples are fed through. There's uh, derivatives that are then calculated backwards, but still that's a feed forward process. And then ultimately um, some final loss function is computed, which then can uh, allow the credit assignment problem to be solved. And you change all the weights everywhere in one monolithic path through that through that network. And, and that, that algorithm is backpropagation, error backpropagation. And that runs fantastically well on this modern computational architecture. Um, but of course, we shouldn't expect that our algorithm to run well on a neuromorphic chip and vice versa. The kinds of algorithms that work well on a neuromorphic chip don't. They run exceedingly badly on this kind of an architecture because of this lack of batching and vectorization. So, so this hopefully is provide some, some aid to uh, a, a sort of a mental model of, of the differences in architecture that, that we're exploring with, with this neuromorphic uh, paradigm. Now, over the past three years, um, we've, we've uh, uh, signed up uh, over 150 groups around the world and many Human Brain Project uh, universities are, are members here in groups um, and they've been exploring this, phase, this uh, space. Um, and and uh, you know, we, we've been encouraging um, on the one hand, a shotgun based approach of just kind of using this uh, Loihi architecture to explore any and all applications that uh, people might have good ideas about how to implement on a neuromorphic chip. And on the other hand, we've been really encouraging a, a very rigorous quantified approach so that we can answer the basic question that we have at this, you know, or we had uh, going into this research uh, phase of of what value can this architecture provide uh, today with modern uh, design methodologies, today's process technology, um, digital design, understanding that we'll have many advances to come uh, that can lead to far more brain-like type chips, but today can we get some kind of computational advantage compared to the state-of-the-art alternative conventional architectures? And, um, and, and for the most part, the results have been really encouraging. So here's just a few examples that, um, you know, we've, we've seen groups develop using uh, Loihi, and there are certainly a few similar uh, examples developed with other, other chips. Um, the, uh, you know, these range everything from, you know, the sensory processing, as you might expect. So processing data like event data coming from these new neuromorphic cameras, being able to perform, you know, gesture recognition and even some work with gesture learning. So after you've pre-trained a model to understand a certain number of gestures, being able to learn new gestures with few data samples and doing this at, at dramatically lower power levels than what uh, would be uh, expected on a conventional architecture, certainly when you're talking about learning new gestures. Um, and other modalities, so things like odor sensors, chemical sensors, where these now are truly inspired from the, um, in, in this particular case of olfaction inspired uh, odor recognition, uh, working with uh, Tom Cleland at, at Cornell, um, abstracting low level biophysical models of the olfactory bulb and replicating the kinds of computational information processing that's happening there and mapping those models into Loihi and finding that indeed these models can perform very well at, at odor recognition and can even learn new odors with single shot presentations, um, achieving a level of accuracy 3,000 times uh, greater than, uh, than uh, what, what's possible. Or, with 3,000 times fewer data samples can achieve a level of accuracy uh, that a deep learning uh, model can eventually achieve. Lots of examples in the robotics domain. So uh, robotics is a you know uh, obviously going back to that autonomous drone and and what brains evolved for in nature. Naturally, we expect to find lots of robotics. Uh, 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 
impact from this technology over the long term. And there have indeed been uh, some, some very inspiring examples, controlling robotic arms with, uh, in an adaptive way, uh, coping with unpredictable changes in the model that might not have been foreseen uh, up front when the, when the model was trained, um, and also bringing understanding some level of higher order cognition to um, robots like the iCub on the right here, uh, where, where, where it's able to scan through the environment, understand what new objects are, keep track of where those are with kind of a place cell type of a network and, and, and recognize when those objects have kind of changed in its visual field. Um, so, so early rudimentary steps there, but still very uh, encouraging. And, and wherever in these cases we benchmark the power and the efficiency and, and, and the latency of processing compared to conventional architectures, we're seeing uh, you know, quite compelling results. And, and some of the most exciting results coming recently are in the domain of, of optimization or combinatorial optimization, which was not something we expected coming into this, uh, this research uh, program. Uh, this has been a pleasant surprise to find that, um, again, networks that are really inspired quite literally from, uh, from neuroscience study. Um, so ideas around say neural sampling of stochastically exploring um, solution states uh, in, in uh, attractor networks. Um, these types of networks are able to solve hard sort of mathematically hard optimization problems, things like constraint, constraint satisfaction or SAT. Um, you know, Sudoku you may uh, think of that more uh, uh, familiarly. Um, but uh, also applying this capability to uh, relevant industrial problems. So we worked with Deutsche Bahn, for example, and we were able to take some of this uh, combinatorial optimization solvers from running on Loihi and, so, and, and, and run the same workloads that they use to, to schedule their railway networks in Germany. And, uh, you know, this is... Uh, uh, you know, obviously a very uh, important problem. Perhaps the energy gains in in a in a railway scheduling uh, workload are not necessary are so valuable. But we were able to solve these problems and outperform the leading commercial solver by over a factor of ten. Um, you know, at thousands of times lower uh, energy levels. So so that that particular domain is 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 very exciting, and I'll I'll say a little more about that shortly. But what we what we can do with all this. Um, data that this community of, of researchers have, have uh, gathered over the past several years is kind of plot this on a unified graph that combines the sort of the energy gain that we've observed from Loihi and the solution time or the latency gain that we've observed on Loihi for all of these different workloads um, that people have, have measured and where they've benchmarked them compared to uh, conventional architectures or alternative architectures. And a very clear uh, a picture emerges from that. So first of all, we see that very large gains are possible. So just again, using digital uh, transistors wired up in a fundamentally different way, programmed in a fundamentally different way from standard computing, we can get orders of magnitude uh, gains in both energy efficiency and the solution time or speed of processing. And the data breaks down remarkably cleanly such that all of the sort of least well-performing examples and some examples which really don't perform well at all are, are, are simple feed forward networks. You know, these are, are the type that run well on conventional architectures and, and, and they're networks that we don't find at all in the brain. So this is not that surprising ultimately that all the best performing examples are, are recurrent networks. So they're using the recurrent connections uh, back uh, and, and of course, within the neuron itself is the limit of that, but, but really in the network connectivity, bringing feedback processes, again, in this dynamical system mindset, feedback is allowing the system to drive to equilibrium states faster and more efficiently than they'd be able to do without that feedback. So that's, that's one uh, very important learning we've had, realization really, that, that it's vitally important to, to include recurrence in the models we're exploring with neuromorphic computing. And we should only expect that the really good gains, you know, compute, conventional computing is improving all the time. So this dotted line, which represents kind of the trade-off, the point between where conventional computing is somehow better versus a neuromorphic approach, you know, this line is moving over time as conventional computing gets better. And, um, you know, recurrent networks is really um, the only category of networks that, that we think over the long term are, are worth exploring on, on neuromorphic architectures. And as we zoom into the very best of these examples, we find that, um, you know, as I alluded to earlier, they, they are all optimization problems. 
systems. And this is really intriguing, again, from the perspective of brain computation. I think if you think about it on a fundamental level, it really seems that brains are continually optimizing in some way. As they move to attractor states, equilibrium states, as they're learning, um, they're trying to um, you know, better represent the world. They're trying to make more optimal decisions. They're trying to evolutionarily trained in, a, in an evolutionarily programmed way, I should say, they are trying to achieve uh, that organism's goal um, to its best ability. And, uh, and, and there's deep reasons at the neuro, neural level where why some of these recurrent networks are, are, are oftentimes moving to attractor states and sometimes they're simply moving between equilibrium states in an, kind of an out, out of equilibrium sense. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, you know, this, this is in some levels what brains are computing all the time. And it's, um, it, it's leading us as we enter this next era, um, we're, we're trying to think of how do we harness this capability and rethink programming computation from the standpoint of optimization being the fundamental computing primitive, as opposed to it being you know, one small class of a large class of, of possible computation uh, that, that your chip may perform. And uh, you know, we we in in our group at Intel, we've been uh, trying to expand this scope out as much as we possibly can. We see great application uh, space for optimization in general, um, and and these are often associated with you know hard, uh, obviously problems and uh, you know intelligent type of workloads yet to be fully unified with. Um, you know, what we think of as AI necessarily, although many AI algorithms are posed as optimization problems. Um, but we see great industrial uh, in impact here, um, you know, a, a, an interesting commercialization path, breakthroughs po possible in robotics as we bring, you know, far more uh, capable uh, optimization capabilities into form factors that previously couldn't have even um, contemplated solving you know, such difficult problems. So model predictive control in robotics is an example. State-of-the-art control of, of uh, you know, high dimensional uh, robotic systems is, is, a, is a hard computational problem and one that we can potentially bring orders of magnitude gains in you know, energy consumption, if nothing else. Um, and so we've been pretty successful. You can see all these different examples of uh, you know, mathematical optimization problems, you know, things like integer linear programming, linear programming, quadratic programming, even Cubo or quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, which is, you know, a, a favorite of the uh, quantum computing community, um, attacking these with quantum annealing uh, methods. And uh, we've been able to solve you know, larger problems, for example, than what D-Wave can solve, much, much larger, um, and at competitive uh, times even. Um, so this is very exciting to us. This um, is a path forward that we see, um, and um, and ultimately, what what you know we've concluded from the past um, three years or so, three three and a half years, is that um, orders of magnitude gains are possible. You know, with this architecture, with the neuromorphic computing approach, um, and you know that that is meaning in the sense of energy efficiency, in the speed of processing, but but specifically in the latency. So the time in handling individual data samples that are arriving in real time, not necessarily throughput, that's a different definition of speed. That's more what conventional architectures are good for, vectorized batch processing. And, um, and then also in the data efficiency of learning in some cases. Um, now, there's, there is a big disadvantage that comes with this architecture that you, you can see in the spider plot. And that's the, um, the cost at the sort of the manufacturing cost of a chip, of a neuromorphic chip. Uh, uh, per capability. So this interwoven nature of compute and, uh, and memory in a neuromorphic architecture means that we don't get to benefit from the, the off-chip memory that exists in conventional architectures. That means to scale up to solve larger scale problems, we have to scale out many more chips um, compute chips, right? Uh, many more Loihis or whatever uh, the chip may be, um, uh, compared to just putting on more more DRAM memory, and and that's important because DRAM is much cheaper than uh, compute chips, and, and that's a consequence of decades of standard computing, where where the manufacturing technology has become very very specialized to produce memory versus the compute side, and. That um, you know is not necessarily a fundamental problem uh, in time. Innovations at the circuit, at the device level, the materials levels will, um, will resolve that. Um, I, I'm quite confident about. But of course, over the near term, you know, the the timescales involved are, are 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 
you know, pretty long when you talk about uh, semiconductor manufacturing innovations compared to the timescale that we would like to commercialize this technology. So, so there is a significant headwind as we go to large workloads, we see this ratio, this cost ratio per bit of storage between on-chip memory and off-chip memory. And, uh, and, and that, that is something that really is going to limit the, um, the, the proliferation of this kind of technology into um, cost-sensitive devices like, like um, you know, your cell phones, consumer electronics. Um, but nevertheless, there are certainly opportunities um, for, for near-term com commercialization that I think we're going to start seeing very soon. Um, now, now these gains that are offered, we we now have um, you know released our, our second generation Loihi. So this is one of the new tools I'm referring to in this talk um, that that we've uh, released to the community. It's all available to um, our sort of engaged members in our evaluation program until neuromorphic research community, and it improves on Loihi in a number of ways. So we've kind of done our best from a hardware perspective to kind of stay up with all the learnings that are coming, um, and we've um, surprisingly gone on and added more programmability, more flexibility to the neural processing. This was a, a sort of counter to our initial uh, perspective on, on the field uh, when we started with Loihi that the, the, the power of this architecture comes from the, the large scale you know, assembly and the connect connections between uh, the neurons and not so much in the individual neural uh, dynamics themselves. But we've seen increasing uh, number of, of examples where the, the, the most best performing uh, network on Loihi actually need quite a rich uh, functional capability uh, or stressing the programmability that exists in Loihi. And so for that reason, we've, we've just gone ahead and made it programmable. And uh, meaning that there's a short microcode program that can be associated with each neuron. Of course, neurons need to share this, this kind of program and a class of, of neurons that they represent. Um, but really from some perspective, this isn't surprising that we've had to go in this direction because the brain after all is not one neuron model. There are you know, hundreds, if not thousands of different neural uh, uh, dynamics that are they're all you know, very, very different in, in how they respond to input. And, um, and it's, you know, it's unrealistic to think that we can design a hardwired circuit that spans that level of diversity that we find in the brain. We might've hoped we could reduce that to a single program, a leaky integrated fire model, you know, Cuba or something like that, which is what we had in Loihi. But in fact, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, we've also generalized the uh, notion of spikes in, in Loihi 2 so that um, rather than be binary signals, which of course is what's predominantly in the brain, for, for our technology, it's, it's incrementally cheap to add a, an integer payload to those spikes. So now we have sort of spikes with a strength that gets conveyed through the network. You know, still sparsely activated, still connected, um, you know, and, and sent, uh, you know, through sparse connectivity, but um, now carrying a graded message. Um, we've enhanced the learning capabilities so that we can support um, emerging need for three-factor learning rules that have been a development that's happened in the last few years, this kind of realization that the best performing neuroscience, you know, learning models have not just presynaptic input and postsynaptic activation that influences how a synaptic connection changes, but also there's some kind of third factor that, that enters in um, that's oftentimes surprisingly locally scoped, it seems. And so the, the architecture we've, we've enhanced to support that. Um, and then we have a whole number of, of changes that we've spent a lot of work on kind of at the low transistor level, just giving just big gains in the raw metrics of the chip. So it's 10 times faster and kind of workload level me measurements. Um, we have eight times the number of neurons, but in a chip that's half the size. And you know that's important for that cost differential disadvantage I was just mentioning. So that in the same amount of silicon area, we can support you know, models that are 16 times larger now for in some cases, uh, you know, given the properties. Um, so that, that just simply helps with commercialization. And um, generally better scaling and integration. So while in Loihi, um, like, like many neuromorphic chips that have tried to scale, uh, the, the interconnect ends up becoming a bottleneck. So despite the sparsity in the communication in these architectures, um, the, the, the large scale connectivity really does need a certain level of bandwidth and um, you know, while still preserving energy efficiency and latency. And we've, we've uh, given a huge boost to that in this, this latest generation.
Example of a new uh, capability that um, we're kind of excited about that um, Loihi2 uh, can support that we're eager to explore is uh, resonate and fire neurons. So as I mentioned, you know, there's a whole wealth of different types of neurons in the brain. Some, some neurons uh, are, are oscillators. Um, you know, they don't just decay away their input as the spike arrives. They, they actually oscillate as a harmonic oscillation. And, and this is a small tweak to a leaky integrated and fire neuron, really. If you look at kind of the, the signal processing diagram of that or what, what's happening from a filtering perspective. Um, but nevertheless, in Loihi 1, uh, it was too hard coded to support such a model, at least not conveniently, not efficiently. Uh, so, so, so this is something that is now just a trivially cha small change in programming in a neuro neuron model. And now we can explore this whole vast uh, realm of oscillatory computation. And so far, we found some pretty intriguing results with this. So for example, being able to compute optical flow um, using uh, uh, spatiotemporal oscillator neurons um, with 90 times fewer operations than what the leading deep network um, solutions to this that use a feed forward, you know, ReLU kind of a network, um, you know, operating on event-based data, um, you know, we can perform same accuracy, in fact, outperform uh, inaccuracy with 90 times fewer ops. And then there's, um, you know, interesting other signal processing applications like short time Fourier transforms, you know, doing spectral transforms, of course, you th would uh, think of as a natural match for resonating neurons. And indeed, there's uh, applications of this and space of possibility with implementing silicon cochlea kind of uh, 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 networks and, you know, these, these sorts of uh, uh, applications. So, so there's much else to talk about with Loihi 2, but of course, don't have time to go into all of what we're exploring there. Um, really, the, the challenges that we're now facing for this next era actually don't relate to the hardware too much. Um, so as I say, we're trying to keep Loihi, uh, it, it, our architecture at the state of the art, incorporating all of this inf uh, learning that's coming from the use um, and, uh, and exploration that's happening in the community. Um, but ultimately, the challenges relate to algorithms, the programming models of really systematizing these examples that we've observed from the community into um, you know, a methodology, something that can be trained to non-experts that uh, you know, can, can now be a, a, a applied to a whole range of different problems. But there's also a software problem and, and, and not just being able to represent these algorithms, but we need convergence in this field. We need software convergence in order to have a functioning ecosystem of developers um, that are progressing this technology and, and, and allowing it to be um, deployed and having different teams building on the results of other, other groups. And that's not something we're seeing so far because of the siloed, fragmented nature of the research um, uh, field in, in neuromorphic computing. And then finally, we do have this cost issue, which is going to be um, a, a, a constraint on the commercialization path of, of neuromorphic technology. Um, and and this, is, this is final one is one that's going to take some time to resolve. Um, but focusing on, on the software problem. So that's something that at, at Intel, we're hoping to, um, to, to, to do something about. And what we've done just in the last um, uh, five months or so is to launch a, an open source software project we call Lava. And this is a new software framework for, for doing neuromorphic computing. So um, for prototyping, for exploring, for deploying um, these models onto neuromorphic chips, th this framework is intended to cover all of this. It's intended to cover as much of the different directions that all these different research groups that we've been observing using Loihi can uh, have been exploring, all doing that within one uh, software framework. At its foundation, it's an event-based uh, uh, computational framework. So you have processes that are all communicating through um, events, asynchronous events. And you know, in the domain of the com conventional computing elements, these may be packets of standard you know, data, formats. Um, of course, in the neuromorphic domain, these are spikes. And, and really, there's a unified view you can bring to com computation with, with the right software framework. We're, we hope it to be multi paradigm. So it's supporting all these different directions, as I say, different ways of thinking about neuromorphic computation. It's multi-abstraction, which is to say that it can span different levels of, of, of programming, of thinking about what this chip um, is, is doing and how you specify the computation. And finally, it's multi-platform, which means that it can run on 
a, a Loihi chip, it can run on someone else's neuromorphic chip. It can run on conventional architectures as well. That flexibility is important for a variety of reasons, for benchmarking, for development, ease of development, where people don't want to necessarily undertake the jump into the neuromorphic realm, um, and, um, and, and ultimately allows us to converge the whole field, we hope, or as much as possible onto a, a single software framework. And, and equally important, th this is an, truly an open source uh, project with permissive licensing, which means that it's truly open to all. If you're a neuromorphic chip developer, you can take this and port it to your uh, platform. Uh, this is not Intel's framework. This is, happens to be an open source project that we are now the primary contributors to. We hope that you know, all of you um, start contributing to that as well. Um, so some of the paradigms we're exploring, we hope to support with this. Um, we have some libraries out released already. Um, we expect this to grow over time. So uh, obviously this optimization route, um, category that we're very excited about, um, you know, this is, this is uh, uh, an example where we can have a few of these solvers out in, in the GitHub site now. And um, neural attractors is an important um, programming primitive as we see it, which brings um, persistence of state, state machines, kind of uh, uh, integrating information and storing it over time, um, it, which is not what, say, traditional neural networks are, are, are good at doing. But of course, this temporal element is, is vital to uh, any kind of a complete neuromorphic system. And, and neural attractors is kind of the right abstraction in our mind to think about that. Um, and then, of course, deep learning. I mean, deep learning is incredibly useful, whether it's applied to conventional neuron models or neuromorphic neuron models. And, uh, and so that is, as, a, as one tool in our toolbox, this is an example of a paradigm that, uh, that LAVA uh, supports. And then moving beyond the familiar to kind of the emerging sort of uh, realm of algorithmic uh, uh, promise, we have vector symbolic architectures, sometimes called hyperdimensional computing, and um, some, some exciting capabilities coming from that and really providing another perspective on a programming model for how you uh, construct these high dimensional neural um, systems and, and, and have them perform very well understood computation. Now, of course, there's there's learning that are uh, fundamental to all of these paradigms, and you know we we see Lava supporting all of these um, um, uh, learning categories as well. So combining model learning along with optimization, so not just optimizing a static problem, but having the the, the parameters and the structure of the problem evolving over time. That's definitely an unsolved problem that we're very interested in. Um, Neural attractors support associative learning. So once you have these stable states, you can look at associations between um, the, the representations of knowledge and, and form fast associations. Um, deep learning, of course, has gradient-based learning, and there's a lot of work in, in, in uh, approximating deep learning uh, in neuromorphic networks, which certainly to some degree uh, may be happening in the brain and, and can be supported by neuromorphic architectures. And then um, in vector symbolic architectures, you have hyperdimensional uh, learning, which is similar, can be similar to associative learning, just in, in, in hyperdimensional formulations. The multi abstraction aspect of this means that we can, we can support uh, entering and, and describing computation at, at high levels of abstraction where you don't need you know, PhDs in neuroscience to, to really understand how to construct the networks. Um, you may have conventionally coded functions and subroutines that run on conventional architectures that are interconnected with the neural processes and all uh, computing with event-based uh, uh, messages. And, um, and, and then there's this decomposition process, and this is what's bringing the abstractions, where you can behaviorally describe what may be implemented at a lower level of abstraction. Um, but to some developers, they need never see the gory details of how a particular behavioral model is abstracted. Ultimately, there'd be multiple levels of this refinement or, or, or decomposition that uh, is, is performed until you get down to the most primitive level, which would be the neurons or this, you know, assembly code that runs on the conventional processors embedded in the system. And, and this, you know, we hope is generally completely hidden from view at the, at the highest level. Um, you know, there, there are uh, compilers of sorts or backpropagation tools that can fully optimize these parameters. Um, you know, sometimes these are just purely analytical engines that generate these uh, uh, connectivity uh, net lists. But the, 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 the model here is that the computation at the high level is emergent again. They're described by, you know, optimization functions of some kind, loss functions, um, perhaps not really mathematically describable, but at least intuitively understandable. And that's arising from the dynamics at the lowest level. 
Um, and then finally, this, this property of multi-platform, as I say, is very important because we want to take that lowest level of description. And again, this hopefully can be cross-platform in the sense of, uh, you know, different uh, programs here, different types of neurons can be modeled on different platforms and different uh, uh, processes conventionally can be mapped to different levels of processing uh, CPUs, wherever they may be in the system. And that, um, uh, of course, allows for mapping the same uh, program across different neuromorphic chips, if that's desirable. But it also, from a very practical perspective, um, it allows us to explore and prototype workloads just running on the common denominator, which is the CPU. And, and that's actually been you know, lacking in many uh, neuromorphic frameworks, um, certainly not supported you know, very well across the whole versatile range of computation that, um, that you know, we seek to support. So those are the, the properties of LAVA that we're quite excited about. You know, it's an open stack, as I say. We hope to integrate third-party interfaces, and some of this is work in progress, interfacing to neuroscience frameworks like Brian, for example. There's a project uh, um, kicked off on that, integrating to robotic frameworks like Ross. Um, even Pine, we hope to, you know, interface to from Human Brain Project. Um, the commercialization outlook, given all that, so as we look ahead to this next era, um, you know, we think inevitably what we're going to find, and you see activity happening, not just at Intel, of course, there's a, there's a, a wealth of startup companies, you know, our host for the session uh, represents one of those, right? So um, initially what we're finding are specialized designs. So, you know, this vision of enabling, you know, the full range of computation that even a cockatiel brain, you know, supports much less a human brain, that's still some time away because of you know, some of the fundamental headwinds, some of these challenges that we have to solve. But nevertheless, in the near term, we certainly do see opportunities for more specialized designs, um, uh, taking the best examples of what we're seeing emerge from this study, and then perhaps hardening that away into um, chips that the primary focus is not neuromorphic computing, maybe, but it's adding some extra efficient, you know, high performing ingredient in that chip. Um, ultimately, what you know we're very focused on is getting the general purpose processor or coprocessor that sits alongside conventional computing. Um, you know that that's my personal ambition is to get that into the world as a as a, a, a coprocessor that stands alongside the the general purpose model that we are so familiar with, um, but able to support this wide range of workloads. Uh, and and you can imagine all the robotics. Um, uh, applications beginning with aerospace, where the you know a domain that isn't so cost sensitive, um, but moving of ultimately into consumer devices of all kinds, um, and then over time this kind of vision of large scale you know human brain scale systems that certainly will come from a commercialization standpoint that's that's further out, um, but um, but certainly with the great scalability what we've observed from from uh, this technology, I think there's um, a case to be made for that being a very exciting path. Over, over the long term. But it will be uh, quite a few more years before we get there. So uh, to conclude and wrap up, I mean, I think we're really seeking your help. I mean, this is, uh, you know, representing maybe industry in general, um, hoping that, the, you know, these fresh, bright minds that are coming out of academia, thinking in this new paradigm of computation, really understanding what uh, brain computation is all about and how that can be mapped into this new emerging computer architecture. Um, you know, we can truly change the face of computing, you know, kind of introduce this new model uh, to the world and provide breakthroughs, you know, orders of magnitude gains to uh, enable new computing applications that just weren't possible before. So, um, so we hope you join us on this, uh, this effort. Um, you know, you can find out more emailing this email address at Intel if you'd like to get access to Loihi and Loihi2 um, and um, simply visit the Lava GitHub um, site and you can immediately um, start contributing there. So 